lecture in this uh, round of uh, sessions or these lectures that we started last week on architecture and globalization uh, in Gulf cities. So last week we had a speaker, Dr. Anas al from uh, Kuwait University, who spoke about the architectural identity of Kuwait before and after uh, independence and how that transformed the, the city, Kuwait city, at the level of uh, master plan and at the level of architectural identities and how that drew, drew connections between uh, diverse skills and diverse uh, knowledge of international architects and he also delved into explaining or critically thinking about the impact of those architects or those intervention on the architecture of Kuwait. Today we have with us, we're pleased to have with us uh, Cristiano Lucetti to talk about Dubai, to, so to talk about the transformation of a city uh, on that has been seen lots of transformations since the 1950s uh, and it keeps surprising us as a, as a city. So uh, I'll just start by first of all talking about the topic in general, which is part of a course, as I mentioned last time, that I'm currently teaching here at the uh, University of Bahrain, Department of Architecture and Interior Design. So, uh, in fact, Dubai uh, is a city of dream. Dubai is a millennium city. Dubai is the, the city of the future. It's a utopian reality on one hand. It's also an emblem of globalization and 21st centuries. There is a lot written about Dubai and there continues to be a lot written on, on, on Dubaiization, this phenomenon that is affecting other cities around the globe. So over the past decades, the city emerged as an international financial hub, as we know it in the Arabian Gulf. Uh, it was once a thriving port, a thriving harbor. Uh, Dubai was a thriving harbor, a fisherman village with a you know, steady and slow uh, life, uh, lifestyle, basically, on the shores of the Arabian Sea. And suddenly it has become a series of iconic uh, small cities within a city, a uh, kaleidoscope of cities within a city. So uh, it formed itself into a new millennium city. It's a concentration of new developments such as Burj Khalifa, such as all these iconic buildings, Burj Al Arab, the Palm, Jumeirah, the world, media city, medical city, and so on and so forth. So it has become a city of spectacles. In other words, this global city uh, somehow is focused on or embedded into this process of image making and uh, tourist attraction of expatriates attraction through the uh, this uh, scene of theater iconic buildings that have been viewed as a way to transform 21st centuries it's not only in dubai it's also in bilbao we talk about the bilbao effect and that, how that affected the uh, industrial city of Bilbao and transformed its image. So Dubai is seeing this, uh, going through this phenomena, basically this experience. At the same time, there are many critiques on this city. So critiques claim that developments uh, in Dubai are manifestation of new post-industrial accumulation uh, of, of images, uh, meaning that they represent a mask within that city for the real estate speculation. So this is what the uh, uh, contentious or the critiques claim. They claim that it's more about profit making, it's more about urban marketing and so on and so forth. So the question is, has Dubai transformed itself into a successful 21st century dream? Uh, is it more so a utopian reality nowadays in 21st century? Or is it an undesirable heterotopia? So uh, some of the questions I would ask myself and uh, Cristiano will delve more into detail on the history of uh, uh, the transformation of Dubai in the 21st century. So I'll uh, first of all introduce our speakers, uh, our speaker for today. So Cristiano Lucetti, whom we're pleased to have today, very uh, thankful. I'm just gonna add some, Okay, so Cristiano Lucetti is currently a doctoral researcher, PhD, civil environmental and building engineering and architecture at Università Politecnica della Marche in Italy. Uh, he holds a Master of Architecture from the Pennsylvania State University, 
For more than 20 years, he taught and practiced architecture and urban design all over the world, many different countries. Cristiano was one of the founders of Laboratorio Arquitectura Nomade, so a non-profit, not-for-profit association founded in 2004 for the research and diffusion of art and architecture. He is also an associate editor of the magazine Compasses and regularly writes about the architecture and urban development of the Middle East. Moreover, Cristiano often serves as a juror for reviews, competitions, and the most important international architecture awards. He co-curated the Egyptian Pavilion at the 2018 Architecture Venice Biennale. The pavilion was shortlisted in the World Architecture Festival 2018, display built projects category, and won the Honor Award at the Cairo Design Award in 2018. And, you know, I've been, I looked at uh, Cristiano's website, showing not only his work, but his uh, students' work in uh, uh, design studios, very interesting work uh, on the context of Dubai, on how to contextualize design and work with the, with the local context, etc. So I hope I covered uh, all details in uh, your biography, Cristiano, and I'll hand it over to you. I'll just take care of the... Uh, uh, letting people in, I think people are in already, but I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Cristiano, for uh, uh, mute yourselves. That would help, yes, great. So I'll hand it over to you, Cristiano, uh, to tell us more about Dubai and this heterotopian uh, spectacular phenomenon. Thank you for being here. Oh. Okay, thank you for uh, your invitation. Uh, uh, I didn't have the pleasure of meeting Dr. Fale in person, but I know that today is his birthday. So happy birthday to you to start uh, with. Uh, oh, right? You. Isn't it your birthday? <laughs> it's the birth, right? Social media tells this uh, okay. news right, about thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So thank, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the introdu uh, introducing the team. I think you say the most of what I have to say. I'm not sure if I still have to give the yeah. lecture. I'm joking. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, um, I'm very, I'm very happy to be part of this course and to give uh, this contribution. I hope you hear me well. I hope the connection will be working and uh, I have many slides today uh, I will put a, a full screen uh, you can see it uh, nicely right <clears throat> yes yes okay so uh, yeah many things uh, Dr. Fale already uh, introduced but uh, uh, somehow I will uh, continue uh, uh, along this line and I will talk about uh, the what I think it's important to understand beyond the uh, the physical uh, representation of the city, what are, might be some of the philosophical aspects behind it, something that is not so apparent and that requires a little bit more depth in understanding the urban context and the urban phenomenon uh, of the contemporary city and globalized city of Dubai. So I will start by uh, saying uh, that uh, what is not, Dubai is not Rome. Right. I, I can take this. Uh, it seems quite obvious, but uh, there are a few interesting points I want to highlight uh, is that, uh, for instance, uh, it will be very hard to try to find a, a, a decent uh, sort of summary in telling the story of Rome in 45 minutes, something that actually can be done with uh, Dubai because uh, um, the, 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 the lifespan of the city is not really that long. While if you think of, of Rome in the thousands of years of its existence, in one lecture we could just cover one aspect. Dubai do have, uh, do has a sort of a, uh, um, kind of a complicated uh, uh, life, let's say, but uh, it can be summarized. And we will try to do this uh, today uh, by starting uh, in uh, um, in uh, by locating it in the around the world, you know, in the in the world scenario, and trying to find out the origin of it and why this became important. You can see from this uh, map that is the map that shows uh, the the lines of trading of historical ancient trading, uh, both uh, uh, by land and uh, and by sea, and you will see the central position of it, basically. Uh, most of these lines kind of come across Dubai and that places it in a very uh, important position 
in the in this context. Um, I always say that uh, some urban entities becomes a reality when they first uh, are uh, represented, at least graphically. And this is the first map of Dubai in 1820. Um, done by the Lieutenant uh, Coogan, which who he was going around the Arabian Peninsula surveying um, these uh, uh, small villages at the time. And as you can see, uh, uh, the, the village was placed along the creek, this natural uh, arm of, uh, of a sea, that the uh, ocean that enters uh, inland is not a river. And you can see, uh, for instance, uh, the, it's described the external wall that was defending the village from the from the land, the danger was coming from the land and not from the sea. Uh, the, 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 the sea in front of the city was pretty shallow and hard to reach. Um, it's interesting to see how the uh, construction of, from the village of Dubai to the contemporary city uh, went on and uh, starting by the, the type, typologies, the founding typologies of the village for sure. The first is the Bedouin tent and then the, the use of the Harish, which was uh, a very used uh, typology of uh, um, residences, really, the, up to the to the 70s, something that people, uh, they asked some young generation if they wanted to live, still live there, and uh, they say they, they will only do it if they had a uh, Wi-Fi. Um, as you can see here, this is uh, a zoom in into the construction system. It's quite intelligent uh, environmental uh, device uh, shows that there is no opening, but uh, the light still can go through. There is, of course, two entrances, one in front for to receive guests and so on. And uh, and uh, I will go quite fast uh, through this uh, um, uh, part of the presentation. This is the, the very well known Bargil or wind tower houses. These were imported by some merchants from North Africa and from Iran the city and this where only wealthy uh, people could uh, actually uh, afford this kind of uh, uh, constructions. Uh, the last uh, uh, typology that we could find at that time is the Burj. Uh, these are defensive tower mostly using uh, local stone or, or, the, or the coral stone. And uh, as you can see in the development of the city, there was some moments that are very important. Uh, for instance, up to the 1920, the population is 21,000, but in 1950, it decreases uh, almost uh, halfway because of the, um, the, 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 the starting of a pearl uh, artificial uh, cultivation in Japan. So this uh, uh, decreased the, the level of the economy. Um, there are some other moments, for instance, uh, the uh, taking power of the Sheikh Rashid bin Said Al Maktoum uh, from the from the royal family, uh, of course, and uh, they um, kind of with this uh, uh, statement uh, is saying what is good for the merchants is good for Dubai was already giving the idea of uh, uh, the, the kind of political direction and economical direction that the city will take. These are the two. Uh, most important people of the modernity uh, in Dubai, the Sheikh and John Harris, who was a, a, a British architect that used to live at that time there and was one of the first architects who was active in the context. Uh, and that together they've been working on defining uh, the first master plan of the city from the organic village, the ancient village uh, started to uh, expand. Uh, through some uh, imported uh, uh, Western uh, um, urban uh, ideas, right? And as you can see from the map, uh, how the organic uh, uh, texture of urban texture and fabric uh, becomes a more rationalized uh, and uh, modern uh, pattern. Then, of course, the discovery of the oil changed everything. Uh, the British protectorate uh, uh, came to an end, and uh, in the 1971, Dubai was part of. Uh, the, the establishing of the United Arab Emirates. And this is the situation that you can see now, the, the division of territories about the, the seven Emirates. Um, since that time, of course, this also asked for an improvement with the new uh, master plan that you can see here. This is a celebration to the modern zoning. You can see the different functions of the city are very clearly defined by uh, by the color. And the other thing you can notice uh, is that the establishing of very important uh, 
a set of uh, uh, infrastructures, uh, road infrastructure, that were all built waiting for the for the city to come. This is one of the characteristics that uh, only one country, a country that can afford to spend so much money in infrastructures at the time uh, were not uh, uh, really needed. So this is a kind of uh, an image of, you can see here the different areas, the Bur Dubai, the regional part, uh, Al Shindaga on the right. Uh, I hope you see my cursor. This was data. There was the commercial part that started to develop after uh, at the end of the of the of the 19th century and the, down here you can see the, the the airport so this we we already in the 70s uh, there is also the first bridge that you can see here in this picture started to to be built um, this is another more important moment uh, is the construction of the world trade center obviously as you can see from this picture there was no need for a for a, a, a skyscraper a skyscraper makes the best use of its tiny lot to put lots of volumes and the surface on the same on the same lot but this was obviously a step into the modernity that the sheikh wanted to do and is also an important gate to this direction that is the 11 uh, road the sheikh Zayed road now called that goes all the way to abu dhabi and this is the uh, infrastructure the 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 the, you know the, the the direction where the actually the, the the city started to grow first of all and uh, mostly because of its relation to the coastline um then uh, in the 80s <clears throat> another actor came to 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 stage uh, and uh, to play a very important role and is the current uh, uh, sheikh uh, uh, the the city realized that, uh, that they couldn't just rely on the on the luck of finding oil in the country, so they had to convert the economy. They they were very smart in uh, hiring uh, all the possible consultants and specialists from the uh, from other parts of the world. And as you can see, this process uh, with the village in the 1950, in the 1973, this was the time of the first master plan. In only 20 years, a little bit more, like 30 years, that's what happened. That's the process of the ex urban explosion of Dubai. Uh, there is uh, some. There are some of these images online that are fun to look at, and it's like a before and after. You can see Sheikh Zayed Road. You see these buildings here. Are those buildings here? This is only in 2003, and the 2003 is quite recent. Uh, but uh, as you can see, it's already changed. Actually, this picture is still uh, that I took in, in 2012. Uh, I took from internet. In 2012 is still missing some towers that uh, are taking place now. This is the, another picture that does the same 1991 to 2016. As you can see, the, the dramatic change, right, that goes from almost a, a, a desertic landscape into a, a very dense urban fabric. The change of the Dubai International Airport, and now the Dubai International Airport uh, starts to become almost obsolete with the opening of the new Al Maktoum Airport. And uh, this is uh, the area of Marina. Uh, they used to be just a, a camp for workers here. That little square is is this one, and you can see again. So you, these are all examples. The golf club that was isolated in the middle of the desert, and now it's like this. And again, 2005, uh, and now this is basically the uh, area of uh, downtown, and you see how that changed in very few uh, years. Again, uh, this is a Sheikh Zayed Road. So at the end, you get this uh, interesting map that was done before 2009 that uh, show how all the projects that were uh, meant to be uh, uh, built in Dubai at that time. So this is a kind of a hypothetical map that shows the development. And of course, it's obvious the reclaiming of the land of the seaside with all this project is supposed to extend. Uh, the possibility of building through the coastline, which I used to say is one of the most important economical value of the city, and that's because of the real estate. In this context, it's also important to, uh, point, to point out uh, who are the people that live in this country. And uh, as you, you can see here, this is the percentage. Some of these numbers are slightly changed, but more or less uh, the proportions are the same. Uh, the Emirati, the locals are only 20 percent. Uh, the majority are South, South Asians, Indian, Pakistani and so on. Um, this is also important, the ratio between female and male. As you can see, the, these are the locals are more almost uh, equivalent. But then if you consider expats, uh, 
it makes uh, the United Arab Emirates and uh, Dubai in a proportion of 80% male and 20% uh, uh, female population. These are some of the pictures of contemporary Dubai. These pictures should be updated every year for the speed of how the city grows and develops and changes look. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there is a contrast between different scales, right? Along the Shades I Road is uh, traditionally where most of the uh, skyscrapers are going uh, to be. And then uh, there are all, all other different elements, as was mentioned before, some of these enclaves that have their own specific characteristics. Um, uh, talking about the reclaiming of uh, uh, the seaside and uh, creating these uh, options for uh, residential projects and uh, uh, very high-end uh, settlements. Uh, this is a very, uh, I don't know if you ever realized, but the, the Palm is in a very intelligent way of <clears throat> providing coastlines and, uh, and the seaside access to and the private beach to each of these villa, although the, as you can see, the sea is not very deep. But that's what drives uh, somehow the development of the city where it's very important, this contact with the with the with the water, right? To face the water. So when the water is finishing on this, uh, well, sorry, where the lands are fully occupied and facing the seaside, then they create usually another canal. And this is with the opening of the Dubai Canal that creates and transform the city, the center of the White Island. Yeah, that's the reason, you know, like it's to have this kind of relationship with the, with the water. So that's something that drives lots of the projects um, and uh, and it's a, a common a common practice that, that defines the, the shape of the city. One very uh, another very important factor is the is the role of the infrastructures that we mentioned before. And these are huge, right? These are really, really important uh, infrastructures that are able to separate the city in different areas and makes them uh, uh, not crossable by pedestrians and does meaning uh, um, a dependence by car transportation, which hasn't been solved is one of the main issues of the city. But as you can see, the, the dimension of, uh, of the of the infrastructure, it's almost as big as the city itself in some in some areas. And these are uh, one of the divisions where you can see that on the left there is a Saudi expressway, then the tailgaters, the daydreamers, mobile phone users, and the small vans, and the six is uh, the undertakers. These are how uh, Dubai people explain their roads. Um, this is a, a one picture of Sheikh the, the road. Uh, you can see how the, the only way to cross by a pedestrian will be these two bridges that uh, matches with the location of the of the metro here. And uh, obviously this defines uh, a very uh, separated areas of the city. And this is one of the most important also characters of, uh, of the city as it is. Uh, the infrastructure, not only the roads, but also, as I said, the, the metro station and most of this structure, as you can see, as I told you before about the roads, were built waiting for the city to come. So usually uh, a new metro station, new public transportation will be built in the middle of a very dense area to provide better service. In Dubai is the opposite. The structure comes and then the neighbor will be built. As you can see here, this example, this is a picture from 2013, and you can see how isolated was the was the was the metro station here mostly happening underground of course and then this is in the picture is a current picture so where everything is is gone really the station was uh, 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 absorbed by by the the new buildings uh, and uh, this is the new development in only uh, in a matter of uh, seven years eight years something like this infrastructures are also others like uh, the the, the sewage system, I don't know if you know about this, but this was quite an interesting uh, condition where the, the Burj Khalifa, ha tallest building in the world, was, uh, was uh, uh, built and the first time they didn't have a sewage system. So they were taken away uh, by trucks and uh, it happened that uh, for uh, the, the truck drivers had to wait for days before dismantling their content into specific uh, uh, structure and um, and uh, you know like uh, the, the system how they they, they, they recycle their content uh, and uh, sometimes these drivers got bored and started to dump 
in the in the desert and eventually the sea started to get polluted so at that time they decided that it was time to provide some uh, serious uh, uh, sewage to the to the Burj Khalifa this is what happens sewage systems of course uh, for a country that is not uh, used to rain whenever it rains this is something that can happen in Dubai now uh, in this process uh, one very important moment is that crisis the economical crisis of 2008 uh, I'm not going to explain what happened because it will take a little bit too long but I remember that at that time I was in Hong Kong and I was leading the design of this project in Ras Al Khaimah and all of a sudden it was, I think, it was September or October that we tried to contact the client. We were almost got to the end of scheme design, uh, and uh, and uh, we contacted the client, and they did disappear. They did just pick up the phone. So what happened? It happened that uh, there was an, um, a credit crunch in the U.S. The story is quite well known, but that's what happened in Dubai in a, in a matter of few months, where the real estate prices have plunged of 50 percent, with expectation for further declines of 20, 30 percent. 400 real estate projects have been frozen for a value of 300 billion, and even the the, the amount of divorce cases has been. Uh, so a, a very high increase. So a, a phenomenon, a global phenomenon that heavily impacted the, the nature of Dubai. At that time also, it was interesting to see how uh, the relationship between the completion of the tallest uh, towers in the world uh, was always matching with a, a moment of uh, uh, recession in the uh, global economy. It happened with the Petronas Tower, it happened with the Taipei 101, and it happened with the Burj Dubai, where uh, the construction began uh, at this time, and then by 2009, uh, there was the, uh, the completion in 2009 matches with the uh, an, uh, global economic crisis. This is the way how Dubai reacted. Uh, this gentleman has 26 wives, uh, please support. Uh, they also thought about uh, kind of a different uh, system of transportation, might be alternative. Uh, some urban legends also started to go around. There was a Dino Ferrari left at the airport parking to get dust because the owner had to flee the country, he couldn't pay mortgages and all these expenses. Uh, so this changed, as you see, not only the uh, physiognomy, the, the, uh, the, the face of the city, but also changed the society uh, heavily. And that was an, an important moment. In that specific moment, many of these projects got stopped. As you can see, all this crown of islands are not there, never built. And uh, it, it got my attention, this uh, project here, which is uh, a business district designed by uh, OMA. And uh, specifically for this project, uh, I found uh, a text by Lebius Woods uh, who says that Dubai is certainly the inevitable place for the realization of uh, Renkula's ideas. It is by now the capital of an economic and political new world order, a city-state without income taxes, labor laws or elections. It is ruled by a corporate oligarchy of hereditary rulers accountable only to themselves and their investors, quite a model for the global future built up rapidly over the past few years on the wealth gotten from the world's greed for oil and more recently as an unregulated sanctuary for cash, he has no depth of history or the indigenous culture, no complexity, no conflicts, no questions about itself, no doubts, in short, nothing to stand in the way of being shaped into the ultimate neoliberal utopia. Some of these ideas can be debatable. I, did, I don't uh, necessarily agree with whatever he says, but what is important is the last part for me, because uh, he was uh, announcing the creation of a sort of a neoliberal utopia. But what is an utopia? Utopia is uh, something that regards, uh, an, uh, again, of course, uh, uh, a community or a society that uh, is possessing highly desirable or perfect qualities, but it is not a real space. So what I'm interested in, in terms of uh, architecture and urban condition, urban context, uh, is the real space, is what is built. So is there a, 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 an idea, a concept uh, in philosophy that is actually taking care of this aspect from under this light? And it is, there is the, 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 the notion of heterotopias that are indeed a concrete physical place uh, in contrast to utopias that are imaginary. 
uh, one of example of Ethereum is are the 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 Ucha China uh, area in Peru where you can see <coughs> the difference between uh, uh, the oasis and the and the desertic context. This is mutuated by the ideas and defined by by a philosopher, uh, Michel Foucault. And that, that, uh, as you can see, he says that the heterotopia is a concept in human geography to describe places and spaces that function in non-hegemonic condition in terms of their difference toward the, the context where they're situated and located. I think that we need to extend and we need to also borrow another concept design, um, defined by another philosopher, by the Bohr, which is the notion of spectacle. Because we, uh, the being only uh, heterotopia in, the, in trying to define the nature of Dubai, it might not be enough. Uh, we also need uh, this kind of other approach. And in, the, in his uh, um, text, The Society of the Spectacle, the commodities rule the workers and the consumers instead of being ruled by them. The consumers are passive subjects that contemplate the reified spectacle. So that's the definition. If we move on again, uh, these are more details about uh, the concept of uh, heterotopia, but I will skip it because I, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about the concept of spectacle by the board, because this is applies really, you understand how this is coherent with the nature of Dubai, especially when he talks about tourism that for him it's human circulation packaged for consumption a byproduct of the circulation of commodities is the opportunity to go and see what has been banalized and in this term in this sense urbanism city planning is a capitalist method for taking over the natural and human environment following its logical development toward total domination capitalism now can and must refashion the totality of space into its own particular decor. So the decor is very important in this context and by combining these two concepts maybe we can come up to this definition and the question is that Dubai a spectacle of heterotopias. Um, to demonstrate this this uh, this idea, um, this statement, uh, maybe we can go and flip through a series of heterotopias, starting from some of the most important icons, the Burj Al Arab, which is a neo-structural uh, building, something that responds to the strength of winds and the local condition and so on. But then inside it becomes, uh, you see, this uh, kind of oniric Arabian representation, the iconography of uh, one thousand nights and so on. So, it, and if you go, if you move in from the from the internal space into the into the bedroom, you can see the detachment and the the, the apparent impossibility of coexistence between the different languages and the different formality of the architecture and these spaces. Something that happens everywhere in Dubai. You can see how things. That shouldn't be together. They, you know, they, they kind of match. You see a camel that are parked, the lion that are inside carts. You see uh, vendors of gold, gold that once you go and had to mine it, that now you can find it and buy it from from these boxes, from these vendors, uh, and so on. Most of these phenomena, which contributes to the idea uh, of creating the stereotype of what happens in Dubai, which is true. So a portion of Dubai is actually like this. Uh, tigers are dogs. And you can see Santa Claus on camels uh, walking around and strange uh, characters. Uh, and uh, again, the conflict between architecture that shouldn't be together, you know, like different languages, different scales, they all clash. What more uh, heterotopic than having uh, a ski slope in, uh, in Dubai, we have that. And also uh, when you go outside and you look at the, the slope, at uh, the ski uh, um, slope uh, within the building, you can see how the coexistence between different elements come together and they create a series of heterotopias where the hegemonic state becomes all an heterotopia. Like uh, in the, the desert that used to be, as the word says, desert, you know, like <laughs> sort of emptiness. Now it's very busy in terms of traffic. And uh, some other areas that uh, are so artificial, that are so uh, different within uh, the natural system of the ocean, for instance, could be uh, by this project that, that uh, is called the world. 
in the world uh, for many years after the crisis was left uh, uh, unfinished uh, and uh, the, the, even the morphology started to change. But now uh, it, the projects uh, found new investors and now we have this project called the Heart of Europe. In the Heart of Europe, uh, it's the iconography of uh, the culture, the European culture. Each of these small islands represents a different country or a different city for some reasons. Uh, again, it's something imported. This should be the island that represents Portofino. As you can see, the quality of architecture <laughs> kind of reply a little bit. The, the, uh, the, the, the colors of the architecture of Portofino, but not really uh, reaching the, 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 the same richness in terms of a spatial configuration. Uh, one of my favorite is actually Swiss. Swiss in the model I found that uh, uh, the uh, cityscape, uh, there was actually snow on the roof. I don't know if they're going to uh, provide this in the real project. Or maybe the, the German island is uh, kind of interesting and somehow fun because the German island will embrace the rich cultural heritage and diversity which Germany and its people are renowned for, and they will provide all these uh, regional specialities, including Eintopf, Bratwurst, Spargel, Sorbat, and, and so on, with the finest German beers and wines. And as you can see, the description of the project, where you can see that you basically in Thailand, somewhere, it doesn't, it just doesn't match. Um, some other examples that I can talk about, and I'm just uh, jumping here and there because I could, you know, we, ha we, we might have hundreds of these examples, but some of the most interesting are those that actually um, uh, embrace the notion of heterotopia and they change it on their own. For instance, uh, the Global Village, which is an amusement park, is an area, it's a public facility, is uh, one of the most biggest tourist attraction, is what we call the heterochronia. Heterochronia means that is an heterotopia that works in time. For instance, this is a village. This is a, it's not a village, it's actually a, an expanding city. And it's one of the, uh, the, you see, it gets more visitors than the world's fourth best attraction. Basically, it's almost visited as much as the Colosseum in Rome, more than 7 million visitors uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, from October 19 to April 2020. And uh, this is expanding, but what is important is that the, it's a place that opens in uh, October, at the end of October, and closes in May. So the span of his life is uh, short and condensed, and uh, it's a part of a city that is defined in time. So the chronia, the time, comes into the concept of heterotopia. It's a series of pavilions where the, the whole global uh, cultural scene is represented. And it, as you can see, it's really the dimension of a small city. There are uh, many small, smaller cities in Italy that are smaller than the size of the global village. Uh, another place that it's really uh, captured my attention is the Dubai Miracle Gardens, one of my favorite areas uh, in Dubai project in Dubai because it's unique. And that's why we call it the Terotopias of Immanence. Uh, and why is that? This is uh, the upper part of the picture is when uh, I, I saw it for the first time in 2012. This was before the pandemic, uh, and, uh, I think in the fall 2020, as you can see how it keeps growing. And basically it's a place where there are 60 million flowers and every summer they are uh, changed and they have a new installation and it's keep, uh, it's keep growing, I think from 60 million to 200 million. But what is important is not really those numbers, uh, but the important part is that this is a place that has no other function than just being itself. And that's why, as you could, whenever you go and browse throughout the social network and so on, the pictures that come out of this place are only this: people standing with the place uh, with the, uh, the the miracle garden uh, in the background and be just uh, at the core of the of the picture. And so this kind of uh, um, introduced this new concept that we try to give for this kind of different heterotopia, which is the, the heterotopia of immanence. The immanence, indeed is a metaphysical philosophical concept, antithetical to that of transcendence, which refers to the quality of what is immanent, that is, what lies in its being in itself as its beginning and end, and being part of the essence of a subject cannot have an existence separate from it. The global village has the function of being itself. Now, this is the last part of the presentation, and I will talk about what can be the future uh, the future moves uh, 
possibly using this definition, Dubaization, which is the process of urbanizing a city with futuristic uh, pioneering architecture. This is one of the uh, legacy of Dubai that uh, kind of apply in many cities in the, in the, um, in the east, especially in the uh, east part of the world. Um, and this is a project of a, of a resort uh, up on the clouds by Atelier Absitus, uh, obviously just a, a theoretical project, but uh, no, no surprise it happens in Dubai. Uh, the epitome of uh, the future is actually the Museum of Future that's being completed now. It's an interesting building, although it's very hard to define it as a building, it's probably an urban jewel that sits uh, conveniently along the Sheikh Tai Road uh, as uh, right next to the right next to the, the World Trade Center. that used to be the gate of the road, and now many other iconic buildings are taking place and replace the modern uh, building. Um, obviously, the future is related to what happens in the Expo 2020. This uh, um, created a, 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 you know, a bubble, really, uh, a perception that the, the Expo will fix everything. And uh, the, you know, the, the area of the Expo was uh, the initiation of a new renaissance after 2009. Uh, most of it was not really real. It changed the economical view. Uh, lots of uh, building and projects have started to be built. Uh, and now there is a problem of oversupply of especially residences that changed the way how uh, Dubai is uh, perceived uh, globally. Some of these projects that you could see a cityscape, I went, uh, you know, like uh, in the last year, cityscape kind of kept shrinking and shrinking. This is the real estate uh, uh, fair in Dubai, very famous. Uh, some of these huge projects were not there anymore. Um, there were some projects that reached levels that were kind of interesting. The Mall of the World was the first proposal for a uh, the first uh, completely air-conditioned cities, which luckily didn't happen. And uh, actually, Dubai started to go toward uh, a different idea of reusing public and open spaces differently than this proposal. But if you look inside the mall of the world, you will see the proposal of this space where the all iconography of fairy tales and the, the, the any any kitsch reference to the, to the uh, border culture, uh, especially from the western part, from Europe, uh, were included in the project. Or some other projects like this were as big as uh, almost uh, the, the whole city of Dubai. And uh, as you can see, the difference in color will also aim to completely change the nature of the city, which I guess was quite unsustainable. Uh, this is Aladdin city that's <laughs> supposedly be built uh, uh, under my apartment. Uh, hopefully it's not going to happen. And uh, many of these examples where Dubai became a sort of a territory for experimentation, for bigger uh, uh, buildings, for strange buildings, for rotating towers or the biggest ferry wheel that we, we will see later has been built. Uh, and it's interesting how uh, to kind of Dubai fit itself in, uh, with the successful features of the city. In one of the projects in Maiden One, uh, there was the tallest residential tower, obviously referring to the Burj Khalifa, the largest indoor ski slope, the water canal, the biggest shopping mall, and the biggest dancing fountains. So these are all the elements that were successful in Dubai, uh, and Dubai was known for, it was kind of included uh, to, to promote new projects. And uh, as you can see, I don't know if you've ever been to Dubai, but as you can see, the, the Dubai dancing fountains are uh, an important tourist feature. And Dubai kind of uh, throughout time, throughout these years, kind of changed and it started to reflect on itself. Uh, this is a, a billboard that you can find along Shades Eye Road. As you can see here for this very exclusive project, they say no dancing fountains here. It's not for everyone. So the process is not finished and that new ideas, new typologies are being uh, starting from the from what was uh, important for the city. They, they change and they are introduced. I think that Dubai Creek Harbor is a very good example for it because it's a genius you know, uh, real estate uh, product. Basically, it's very expensive to build these very tall towers, um, and uh, the, 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 the revenue of the tower is not on the tower itself, but uh, in the mm, land, 
the value of the land around it. So basically all these buildings will be more expensive because they have a view toward the central area. As you can see, this is the rendering. It's nothing like this. It looks like a, it's in Belgium somewhere. <laughs> everything is green on the renderings and then in the reality everything is orange. But the, this tower doesn't have any residences. So basically it's basically a view platform. It has some trees uh, up in the sky. But it's very cheap to build, relatively cheap to build compared to the Burj Khalifa. So basically, this is a, a feature uh, that can, it's a global icon, of course, that will increase the land and the value of the uh, real estate around the tower. But the tower itself is just basically a very, very tall pavilion. So, and as you can see, they make sure that in every rendering that are prepared to sell all these residents, the tower is always there. So we get to the final part of the presentation. Obviously, the pandemic is another milestone in the history of this uh, heterotopia. Um, as you can see, property prices have slumped more than 30% from 2014. 2014 was the reaction to the announcement of the Expo. And bankers and analysts were speculating whether the build it and the will come model has, has run its course. Probably it's not like this anymore. It's interesting, this graph. This chart that you can see, the 2009 economy, they went down to five, minus 5% and it went up again with the announcement of the Expo and slowly, slowly went down to reach 2000, the bottom part of 2017. Something happened in 2020, it was the pandemic and they're very optimistic to see this, which I want to see. We are in 2021. I don't think that's happening. But uh, what this means, um, translated into uh, the, the sum of the projects that uh, you can look at is that the, the project changed their nature, they changed their value, they changed the architecture and the urban uh, design and, uh, and planning of the city. And this is, if you can choose, if I can choose a little bit, uh, some of the projects, uh, this is one of my favorite, is a Falcon City of Wonders, what they call the Wonder Heterotopia. In the Falcon City of Wonders, uh, there are uh, grouped uh, seven wonders of the world, uh, this is the model uh, that you see uh, the cityscape. So they have uh, the Paris and they have the Pisa Tower and they have the Taj Mahal, Big Ben and so on. So in, to place this, to make this project attractive, then we bring Europe or global icon into the project. And of course they have to be changed because placing a structure without function is not uh, uh, economically valuable, they have to be transformed in shopping malls. Uh, shopping malls that because of the Falcon City also has a Falcon head on the roof. This is really kind of an interesting approach, although kind of kitsch, of course. What is really, uh, I was interested to see when I visit uh, the cityscape and I found this passport that you get if you become a, a resident of Falcon City. In the passport, uh, there is the Dubai Leaning Tower of Pisa will have the same tilting degree like the original located in Rome. Um, I wanted to tell them that the, 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 the power of Pisa is in Pisa, is not in Rome, but that doesn't really matter because you can see I went to the cityscape and I was trying to measure the tilting degree if it was actually the same of the one in, sorry, of the one in Pisa. And uh, at the end, the project uh, uh, has been built, uh, not entirely as they want. There are no traces of wonders around. Um, these are the, the villas they provide, and I want you to notice the price of it. Uh, the time was uh, 6 million 220 dirham, and for a four bedroom village, if you search for them online now, it's to 2 million 700. So you can see how the both the economical crisis uh, and the pandemic uh, kind of severely hit the, the, the value of these properties. The Falcon uh, shopping mall changed its face and became uh, still a Falcon. Um, it's located there within the project. I don't know if they're going to build it, but they, it actually now has a, a kind of interesting uh, elevation, but the plan still makes me wonder what makes a head of a Falcon as a, as a functional and interesting architecture. This is something that I will need to study more. Um, the huge, the biggest ferry wheel has been built, although the, you know, as you can see here, only this uh, uh, capsule here has been added. Uh, it's only the ferry wheel, so it's not going ahead. And there are phenomena, social phenomena again, 
for instance, there is this photographer is capturing three family portraits for people living in Dubai. Seems like 10% of the expats already left Dubai. And this makes a very uncertain future. What is going to happen after the pandemic? Nobody knows. I'm ready, though. I'm ready. I'm, uh, I have my setting ready. Uh, uh, the Expo 2020 trans, uh, transforming to 2021. We will see what happens. And if you want to know more about this topic and if you want to follow what I write and what I publish about Dubai and the context, uh, this is my uh, website. And uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very thank much, you very uh, much for, for, the, for the presentation. presentation. Uh, uh, I, I see some parallel between Dubai and other cities, for example, uh, Las Vegas and the famous book Learn from Las Vegas talking about the ducks and decorated sheds. And uh, I mean, I did my research on Dubai and on uh, Tunisia as well. And I looked at Dubai as a, a phenomena that we need in the 21st century, I, even though it's a contentious urban phenomena. Uh, we need it as a laboratory of ideas, as a laboratory of experiment experimentation. Whether we agree on how Dubai is moving forward or not, it is a needed uh, element in this 21st century, in shaping global uh, uh, cities in 21st century cities, basically. So uh, thank you very much for offering this insight from the history of Dubai, from the pivotal moments, especially 1960s, that marked this increase in oil discovery and oil export, etc. It's not only a moment in uh, the city of Dubai, but it's also Kuwait City, but it's also other Gulf cities that between 1960 and 70s with discovery of oil and more oil explorations, uh, the urban context, the uh, sp let's say the spectacle of cities in the Gulf changed uh, increasingly. So I'm going to ask only one brief question and then I'll uh, uh, wait for other questions from our colleagues, from our students. So uh, now years ago I met with the uh, urban designer Jan Gell uh, the famous young girl who designs urban spaces and public spaces and looks at the scale of cities or the human dimension. And I met him in his office in Copenhagen and asked him, what do you think about Dubai? He said, uh, I would never design a building in Dubai. I don't know if he kept his promise or not, but uh, what I gathered from him is this uh, one quote that I will never forget. He said, buildings in Dubai look like uh, perfume bottles like uh, Coco Chanel and so on and so forth. And they don't talk to each other. There is a problem that uh, in, in uh, you know, uh, the dialogue between buildings, basically the spaces in between buildings that he talks about. Uh, another aspect in his in his uh, research and practice, he looks at the speed within cities and how that affects the uh, human dimension. So in his book, on the human dimension, he states that Dubai is primarily 100 km per hour city uh, with large spaces, large signals, large buildings, high high level noise. So it's not uh, six kilometers or five kilometers per hour architecture, which is a more of an intense, uh, rich, intense, small connection with the building, etc. So my question to you is, uh, with this 100 kilometers per hour or 60 kilometers per hour city uh, defined by Angel as an interesting, as tiring experience and so on and so forth. Uh, do you think that Dubai could have uh, evolved differently in that pivotal moment, on that important moment of 1960s? Do you think that this Gulf city could have taken uh, or uh, how would it uh, how would you think of, of this city in relation to sustainability, in relation to uh, resilience, let's say? Would that moment in the 1960s, could, have, could that moment be, be, uh, have taken the city in a different direction? What, uh, what is your take as an, uh, as an architect in relation to this? Well, um, thanks for your question. Uh, well, uh, keep reminding what the Sheikh said. Uh, what is good for the merchants are good for Dubai and the other way around, right? Since the history, every, since then, Dubai always uh, um, responded to economical instances. Yeah. So profit is the driving force of everything happens at the urban scale of the city. That's it, first and only. And this happens because obviously uh, it's different than other contexts like in Italy. You know, not always the profit uh, is uh, accepted as the driving force. There might be some other public interest. But when 
the participation of the people is not the, in the decision making, then everything is left to a certain oligarchy that decide on their own. Obviously, taking care of certain parts of the city because it's not just exploitation. There are lots of advantages for the Emirati who lives there, right, and uh, enjoy this kind of approach. Now, Dubai changes uh, more than any other city in the world to the global condition. So, if the global uh, economy uh, is uh, shrinking, then Dubai is affected. If it's blooming, Dubai is affected and respond to it. It's not what happened in the 60s, but it's what happens every year that changes the city. And you can see reflected to how the city changed its context, its urban perception and what happened. For instance, um, I wrote a, an a essay uh, called Dubai Walking City because in the last six years, uh, the, this idea of perceiving the city throughout a certain speed and use it through uh, infrastructure and cars has changed. And why this has changed? Because the huge investment of creating the first uh, open air and totally pedest exclusively pedestrianized uh, shopping center, which is called the beach, the JBR beach, um, which is by the water again, uh, was extremely successful. So in the summer, nobody was going there, but they made so much money throughout the winter that they say, oh, well, wait a moment, it's worth it. And now you have five or six examples and it's growing of totally pedestrianized centrality in the city that was mostly infrastructural. So as you can see, the changes go because of where value is, right? So now, Another example, and I, I will conclude my uh, response, and I hope I reply to your, to your question, is that the attention to social, not social, but affordable housing, and the importance of taking architecture into the desert, far away from the city. This is a new trend that wasn't there before. Before it was only high-end residents and, and architecture. Now they're not coming anymore. They say, oh, if you build it, they will come, but they're not coming anymore. So what do we do? So now we change the product. There is an oversupply of residences, so we change the we change the, the, the model, we change the architecture, we change the value of the architecture, and we open a new market. And Dubai is changing its uh, um, you know, look and appearance and urban structure because of this process and so on. So it's a, it's a constantly organic uh, growth that uh, is uh, intimately connected to the political and mostly economical global condition. All right, thank you very much for your question. I have a, there is a question written here from uh, Nihal Al-Morabti. Uh, so Nihal is asking, uh, in your opinion, what are the design guidelines that outline Dubai's future cityscape? What are the design well, guidelines? These are, this is it, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, the, the question of uh, designing buildings like, uh, perfume bottles, you know, that metaphor the young girl uh, used to do. It's true. It's true. And uh, because uh, uh, somehow uh, I also wrote another piece called The End of Iconism or Iconism, which, you know, seemed that the projects in Dubai kind of started to lose that this uh, idea that uh, every building needs to be completely strange. The examples that uh, I show was from a few years ago. Uh, and because of the crisis now, um, you know, during a crisis, only the best products uh, um, resist the crisis, you know, like the, the bad products, the bad design are uh, failing. So now there, there's a sort of a essence, looking for the essence of the functionality, of the value, of making the best out of a limited economy and the, the take, making the most out of the investment. So the architecture changes, of course. Uh, in this process, the role of school of architecture is very important. In the future, we will have future architects. Unfortunately, what I see around is that the attention to understanding the context and the process of learning from Dubai is very limited, especially because of new technologies. Everyone is going crazy for pavilions or benches or parametric uh, uh, condition, laser cut and 3D printing, and we're forgetting the nature of cities and how to design architecture in the cities. In this sense, uh, Yangel is totally 
you know, I totally agree with him because it's a constant fight. Architecture, especially in Dubai, gives the opportunity of creating a plastic object that has no context whatsoever. But this is because uh, it's very difficult and not so fun to learn from the city, right? To what happens. These are long processes, while it's much more fun to play with a robot, you know? Right. <laughs> this changes the way how we design cities, and I think the role of uh, School of Architecture will be extremely important. Uh, more than ever in the near future. Thank you, Cristiano. So, uh, Cristiano, so we're waiting for uh, other questions. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or write it down or whichever way you you prefer. So, more questions from our colleagues, from uh, our students. Hello. Yes, uh, yeah. Can I? Uh, first sure. of all, thank you so much for the inspiring um, lectures and uh, it's a really, really a uh, subject that is really we need to learn a lot for all the cities uh, of how to um, think in and understanding the city itself. Um, as you know that uh, this, uh, what is shaping the city is that there is a bottom up uh, process and the top, uh, uh, top down process. And it's seeing what is actually uh, dominated by Dubai is actually its top process, which is um, that's killing the, the, the or let's say, uh, uh, kind of shaping by the microeconomics uh, factors more than the social culture factors. And this battle is actually um, uh, still exists at relatively in the very different uh, cities in the Gulf and uh, in, 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 uh, across the world. Um, I was really one of this uh, uh, against any uh, artificial islands, man-made islands, uh, to be honest. And, uh, but it was surprised me, uh, later on, I'm, I'm absorbing these artificial islands in Bahrain, uh, for instance, and paying attention how actually that uh, with this artificial uh, configurations arrangement by top-down uh, decision, or let's say real estate investor, to uh, drag this uh, um, economics uh, generator, that bottom up from the local itself, this there is a kind of ad adaptations and uh, uh, modifications going on in the micro scales of the cities itself or this islands, and surprisingly make it very livable city. Um, uh, I was like like um, uh, impressed uh, that how this uh, providing at least like a street uh, walkability street or um, a reaching uh, land used of a uh, different uh, purpose in, in a very uh, approximate distance of a local uh, uh, distance. It was fascinating, especially within the pandemic uh, situations, um, where you see a lot of livability happening, let's say after the sunsets at least, uh, if it's hot climate. Um, change. So I, I, I was really now questioning, it's like there is still this actually forces is still coming from the bottom up to adapt and modify to satisfy their social stability. You know what I mean? So I wonder if, I mean, this is happening in Bahrain and it was like really shocking for me to absorb it for several years now. And um, I start believing that there is a, a strong power, whether even the top uh, the, uh, uh, designers who come with their proposals, can also the top uh, bottom up uh, of the from the social aspect that it's uh, uh, with incremental changes through these times it, it making a significant uh, changes also uh, unexpected. Uh, I wonder if there is something happening right now in, in similarity uh, from your observation from your uh, uh, from your observation observation for the different cities in uh, in uh, in Dubai. Um, that ha actually have this similar phenomena. Uh, OK, thanks for your question, but I need to know a little bit more because uh, <clears throat> are you sure that the projects that you're mentioning has been initiated by the mod up uh, decision? Because I don't um, think 
you know <laughs> i think okay. that uh, i think that people are using good projects you know people are happy when the quality of the project that is provided uh, is good so in mm. this sense that as i said before that there is a, 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 um, a way of transforming the city of Dubai because of the success of a pedestrianized areas, something that didn't exist before. We, we need to uh, remember that the local Emirati people, we, they wouldn't get out of the car to go grocery. They sure. will wait inside the car to grow the grocery come into the car. <laughs> you understand? So the, the question of, of walking it, it was never been a question, you know, it wasn't there. Now, if you go to some areas in the near downtown, these are places for the local Emirati to scroll up and down as they will be in a small village in Italy, you know, in, the, the, in these uh, central areas. Is this coming from the bottom up? No, it's coming from the top down and it's coming through a successful projects that have found out the potential um, revenue that comes from a different way of using the city. Now, is this all bad? No, it's not. It's not bad. It's good. The only problem is that uh, there is, these spaces are never really public. So they're always private. So in these spaces, although you think that uh, people are uh, using it well and so on, you're not free to do whatever you want. I'm not free to bike around. I can go downstairs in my village and bike around because the, the space is public, so okay. it's allowed. If I uh, bike around uh, the JBR uh, beach, uh, someone will come and will say, this is not allowed. And there is yeah. always a series of behaviors that are allowed or not, right? Okay, so I'm a, a Pakistani worker. Am I allowed to be here? Mm, not so much. So okay. now the point is that the, the quality of the project uh, is there, uh, it works well, but the question is for who, you know? Mm -hmm. So see. you see, and that will be the bottom up approach. But the, I think that even the projects that you're mentioning, although I know, don't know them and I might be wrong on this, of course, it's still top down. And it's yeah. top down because of they found a new quality for the urban scape. And it's an a valuable econ economical valuable uh, solution, which makes yes. the cities better. Yeah, no, I'm not, don't get me wrong. You know. No, I'm not in denial of top uh, uh, top uh, decision makers uh, to the bottom of the uh, cities itself. But I was surprised. Actually, I think it's uh, the crucial or the key issues here is that creating environment to. Um, a friendly walkability is a one uh, successful element in designs to consider. Also, this accessibility of all the ethnicity and diversity of peoples is also an important. Uh, shaping the configurations of the uh, places of with where uh, synchronize uh, our uh, synergy between local and global structures is also an important. How to corresponding to this mega global structure of the city within the so I think there is an element playing a, a, a really an interesting that I was like a doubt about it when they starting proposing but and now we, when you're testing these things that how people using the space it's fascinating me uh, and I think uh, 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 it's I don't see the foreground and, and, and background network of both is is a one thing as a as a city object and so that's why both uh, for factors and variables is playing a role, uh, bottom up and uh, uh, top down decision. But if they have a dialogue to understand, I think we, we're learning so much from Dubai and from the uh, new mega projects uh, where this is uh, big questions even in, in Europe and UK, this is huge mega project that is we don't have uh, any clue what it will be uh, related to the whole as a part, you know, so it is very interesting that Dubai started even earlier, so we can learn to, you know, uh, uh, avoid it, uh, our mistakes, or learning for enhance these uh, factors to to the future of the designs. Uh, but definitely, they are both exist. Sorry for taking it so long. But thank no, you. So uh, much. Uh, thank you very much. Interesting uh, point. Interesting thank point. you very thank much, Rova. Very interesting. I think we have a question from uh, Marilia, who has been waiting. Marilia. Yes. Hello. Hi. Can hi. you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. So
So um, thank you so much. Uh, it was really interesting your um, uh, your webinar. I was impressed by the image you shared with us about the fully air conditioning city that, as you said, thank, thank God didn't happen. But um, uh, I was wondering, can you see any interest into green sustainable architecture right now in Dubai? Because I I can't, uh, I don't know if, uh, there is, is there any future? Uh, there is. Every time you ask me these kind of questions, I will reply always the same way. Is there an economical profit? Yes. OK, sustainability is good. OK, so there is a, a neighbor, the residential neighbor called Sustainable City, which is, you know, near some areas, uh, which is one of these uh, gated communities, but it brands itself as a sustainable community. The houses they have been sold out, right? They're all gone. Ah, OK, so we can make money out of sustainability. Let's improve sustainability. It's not 100% like this. There is a, a global idea that sustainability is necessary, and it's necessary because it makes you save money, you know, as well. It became an economical uh, good somehow. And because of this, this will be implemented more and more. So now the process of transformation of Dubai started from before being, you know, only the, the, the only way of getting income was uh, a free trading and the, the oil. Now it became the tourism and finance, and now it will become something else. So we are attracting, we are, Dubai is attracting new residents because people are living and they're providing better spaces, more sustainable way of living because it's more attractive, therefore more valuable. So there are many examples of how Dubai is undertaking these directions. And uh, it's, it will be, as it is in many different fields, a leading, a leading actor in this path. But the reason behind it, it's because it's convenient, okay? So keep yeah. this in mind. Uh, and I'm sorry, myself, I'm a, an historical materialist. So no wonder I always explain whatever happens around me from an economical point of view. And if I double check this approach into the logics of development of Dubai, I always find it, you know, it's always there. And so that's why I explain it this way. But for sure, sustainability, it's a, will be, it is right now already, and it will be an important uh, factor in the uh, process of the city, of the future uh, development of the city, that's for sure. Thank you. We, Thank you. we have a question from SNA external. Uh, so SNA, I'm not sure what your name is, but please feel free to ask a question. Hi, I'm Sana, actually, sorry. <laughs> I don't I didn't know how to change my name actually. So I don't use meat, but I have um I don't know something for uh, a um a concern actually because I'm from Saudi Arabia, so I see this happening now. It's exactly and um I graduated from Art Center College Design where seventy percent of students go to Disney to work. So we had a talk one day and I went there. It wasn't, it was a lecture and it wasn't um, uh, mandatory. So when I went there, they were talking about their mega projects in the Middle East and they were like describing us, or like not me personally, but the projects as naive, right? Because Disneyland is actually a city. It's not like a, a project you go to like a mall like a huge mall. No, it's a city. It's a huge structure. You need a lot of infrastructure. And then a lot of other projects like Legoland and so many other ones. I don't know if they are all just talks, but I'm sure that Disneyland is in the process. So it's a concern that when we talk about economy, we know that 70% of Saudis are younger than 29, which I, I am older than 70% of 18 million people here. And I think when you make decisions for 
the younger of us like um, focusing on entertainment and econ- economy like in this sense it's not i'm not going to say sustainable but i'm not going to say like it's it's wise because i think at this point of time people need to relax and like have good housing and good like um convenient life not like uh, i don't know like uh, bold and um exciting like las vegas kind of style so and then I also assume that these mega structures are consuming a lot of their money. So actually the city is that the old cities are not gaining a lot of attention and actually deteriorating. And it yeah, so and you can see this. Like it is obvious. It is uh, you can see the city now, the uh, the city where we live are not being taken care of as much as they were before projects are shrinking and they're all going to this kind of entertaining city like a city of flowers somehow or the city of uh, i don't know this iconic tallest building just because it's perhaps it's cheap because there are not many floors and i don't know things it's not functional but um after all, I think uh, as much as it's beautiful and it's fun and I would really love to go to Dubai anytime, I would, I say this is my, it's a concern. I would love to go to my city where I feel like I'm free, like really, like I can do things. I can go to the beach, not worry about paying for entrance to the beach. And the beach is paved and there are like, umbrellas or like shading system like something that is usable like not to the, I go to the landscape and just have fun with it that we need to create structures to use the space the city but in a way that is public and then when we all go to this capitalism and uh, uh, investment um, I don't know style of economy we're going to lose so much of what we have now as freedom, I assume. And then, I don't know, that's my opinion. I, I really would love if you can shade, uh, like shed some light on this uh, point of view. Or like concern. Well, what's your name? Sana. 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 Where are you from, Sana? I'm from the Mom, Saudi Arabia. Ah, the Mom. Okay, I didn't catch that. Well, you know, good luck. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you're talking to an old man who gave up on whatever you said and became a, a, a journalist <laughs> who studies the phenomenon, but unfortunately sees that uh, these are very, very big processes. Uh, and, uh, and somehow at your age, I was uh, saying the same things and eventually um, then you put together a family and other things keep you busy <laughs> and you give up on saving the world. Now, jokes apart, your uh, analysis is perfect. You know, like you're describing a condition of uh, the um, geographical uh, contemporary context uh, in the region. That's how things works. And now uh, I can only say, and maybe I shouldn't say, that uh, these kind of things that you're noticing and makes you worried uh, comes from a very specific uh, political uh, asset, you know. Like uh, this is this is the way how the the the, the region uh, um, develops and uh, somehow it's controlled and uh, improved, and that's the direction. Now, if I don't know if you want to change this or you're only concerned about it, but if you want to change this, the political uh, setting has to change. And then everything will change culturally and, uh, you know, the way how it expressed into the built environment and so on. So these are very big uh, questions and are totally legit, especially from young people. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's very important. But uh, me personally, as an architect and as observer and as a critic, I can only, as you said, shed light. And I think I hope I did this through this lecture, where I highlighted certain questions 
And now new generation of architects and designers and uh, political uh, agents and uh, so social, um, I don't know, characters must uh, undertake uh, um, new ideas and uh, express them through their work, through their design, through their proposals uh, and so on. This is what I can say because uh, the questions that you're raising is something that uh, might take a few years <laughs> to, to answer to. Is it okay? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good okay. luck. Eh? That was great. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Sana. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Cristiano. For uh, we'll always have contentious questions about Dubai and other Gulf cities. We'll take one last question. It's twelve twenty. We have classes at twelve thirty. But we'll take one last question. Uh, if anyone has a question, a burning question, I'm sure there are many burning questions, thousands on Dubai. But let's take a last one. Don't make don't make difficult questions. <laughs> I might not know how to answer. I have a funny uh, note or like an idea, if I may add. Sure. Please. If uh, let's say if Dubai like didn't invest in um, this kind of economical uh, way, what if they like? If you can imagine with me, it's just like a, a hypothetical situation. If they can. Uh, like give bigger chunks of land to the people who are resident there to create their own house, maybe farm next to the house and like marina next to the house, like just in a like in a scale that is very luxurious for the resident. You know, I wonder if that could be like perhaps the utopia, like we're not just living in a city that is just um, convenient but in a city that is very luxurious but with a huge land and for i don't know the local it's already I happening know. it's already happening exactly what you described it's happening but this is somehow detached from the urban scene you know as a, do you remember the slide where i showed that uh, only 20 percent and maybe even less of the people are locals okay so yes. the majority of the urban context doesn't appear to so evident. What we're interested in is not the program of national housing provided by the government, which is in, in place since the 70s, and they do exactly what you're talking about. They give uh, huge lots where, and they give money, interest uh, zero on mortgages, or they give you a house. I'm researching exactly this topic these days. But this, again, it's another issue. It's another concern because uh, this causes urban sprawl. So if the government and uh, you know, uh, urban designers and architects all agree in the notion of density, to increase the density, to reduce uh, all the bad things that comes with urban sprawl, uh, locals don't want density because density means uh, less privacy and uh, if you break that contract of uh, being totally private it, i mean imagine a europe where there is a villa surrounded by wall it doesn't exist you know even north america the, you do have your front yard or your backyard that maybe the backyard is uh, fenced off but the front yard no it's open and here no you must have your own uh, private lot and this exactly happens what you said. The government is supporting nationals with a housing program that provides them with villas, not even just like a social housing, you know? So they have lots of benefits, but these benefits comes uh, obviously from the oil, but uh, from the, the whole rest of the economy, because Dubai doesn't have much oil, right? It's only 4% of its economy. So. But it comes, uh, uh, the money to support the locals comes from the rest of Dubai, which uh, uh, it's explicit in the way uh, we described already. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens. So there is, these are existences that kind of uh, areas that coexist, right, in the same reality, but we're not attracted to it because it's a minority. I think I'll, uh, I'll have to interrupt because we might be running out of time. Sure. Uh, there was uh, Adul who had a question. I'm not sure if you still have a question. You could ask it if you like. Otherwise, you could uh, send it by email. Adul, are you here? No. 
I think Adul is not with us. She she left the session. All right. So thank you all for joining. It was a pleasure uh, hearing from Christiane on this content uh, contention on Dubai's urbanism, Dubai's uh, architecture of the 21st century, and how the entire city has uh, evolved our perception of uh, future cities, of millennium cities, 21st uh, 21st century cities. Uh, so if you have any other questions, I'm sure there are other questions and debate will continue for the next years. Uh, so please feel free to send them by email. I mentioned my email in the chat and I'll forward them to uh, Cristiano and uh, hopefully we will have some of some of these questions, especially from our students whom are probably my students whom I probably haven't heard today. So we will discuss your lecture again in, in class this week. Thank you again, Cristiano, for uh, joining us. It was a pleasure having you here in Bahrain, but virtually. <laughs> My <laughs> pleasure, time. and I hope it will be physically soon, right? Like we, <laughs> we will have to finish this this, this, cool. this problem, <laughs> this <laughs> nightmare. We were all living. That's yeah. the hope of every human being on this planet these days. So hopefully, this nightmare will uh, will finish soon and we'll go back to normal. So uh, thank you all again, and uh, we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you again. Bye. 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 Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.